Every day when I wake up in the morning, I see the sky and I think about the things that you've made, all the beauty and your glory is showing. Yeah. It never bores me to look at the ocean. The waves are crashing, the water spraying up in my face. I look above and all the seagulls are soaring. Yeah. Got to overcome the darkness so we don't get caught in the middle between the hopeful and the heartless. So, hello, good day, good morning. I just can't stop smiling because today is a brand new day. And all the darkness and the pain is just fading behind me. Oh, Lord, what a beautiful day. All the planets surround me The way they orbit just boggles my mind The way the sun keeps on shining, yeah We've got to overcome the darkness So we don't get caught in the middle Between the hopeful and the heartless So, hello, good day, good morning I just can't stop smiling Cause today is a brand new day And all the darkness and the pain is just fading behind me Oh Lord, what a beautiful day There's nothing to fear, it'll be okay It's the day that the Lord has made Day that the Lord has made. There's nothing to fear, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. It's the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has it's made. The day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has made. So, hello, good day, good morning. I just can't stop smiling. Cause today is a brand new day. And all the darkness and the pain is just fading behind me. Oh, Lord, what a beautiful day. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Live with Doug. We are live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, thinking through God's word together. And today we're going to do some questions and answers, uh, at least partially stemming from our recent study of Romans 9 through 11, and what about Israel? And so that's uh, the plan for today and tomorrow and Friday. That's if we have enough questions and enough interest in that. Otherwise, I don't know, we'll do something else. Uh, so I'm trying to think here of what the best approach is. I saw a couple of comments um, that I want to get to. I didn't have a chance to really look at them carefully, so uh I will be pondering them kind of on the fly here, but I think what I'll do, uh, since they, they seem to stem from Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, we'll, we'll kind of walk through that, um, and I'll give you kind of my view of what's happening there, and then see what questions may come live here or get into the uh, to the chat. So let's, uh, let's look at Matthew chapter 24, and let me pull that up for you. Here we go. So we have... Jesus coming out of the temple, and he was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said, do, not, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. So, got the setting. The uh, disciples are looking at the temple. Jesus says, yep, they're going to be destroyed. The temple's going to be destroyed. They'd already been through this once in 586 BC, and now Jesus says it's going to happen again. This got the attention of the disciples, right? And we discussed this earlier. <coughs> Excuse me. They would have um, known about the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple because it's predicted in Daniel and Isaiah and so on. So when they hear Jesus say this, it gets their attention. So they come to him 
Uh, they're sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples, and this, by the way, is why it's called the Olivet Discourse. Uh, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, they all contain this, uh, this event, and it's taking place on the Mount of Olives. And so in your commentaries and theology books, it'll often be called uh, the Olivet Discourse. Someone asked the question, and it was a good question, why doesn't John record the Olivet Discourse? And I believe the question was asked in, in, the, uh, in connection with the fact that I, I was uh, speaking about the debate uh, about whether or not Revelation was written before or after 70 AD, which will have a huge impact on your understanding of the book of Revelation. If it's written before 70 AD, then a good case can be made that it was largely predicting the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. If it was written after that, then uh, it probably wasn't talking about the fall of Jerusalem that had already happened by the time it was written. And uh, someone asked the question, if, and I think this is implied in the question at least, don't mean to misrepresent anybody, but if, uh, if it was written before 70 AD and largely concerned the fall of Jerusalem, John is the one who received this vision, why doesn't he in his gospel um, give us any indication of, uh, of the Olivet Discourse? Why doesn't he talk about it? It's a reasonable question. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Anyway, back to the text. <clears throat> good morning, Salty One and Manuela and Peter. Keith, good to have you all with us this morning or this afternoon or this evening, wherever you might be in the world. So he's sitting on the Mount of Olives and the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things happen? In other words, when will the uh, destruction of the temple occur? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, here's where uh, the two interpretive views depart from one another. Uh, the sign of your coming, they're asking about the destruction of the temple. Is Jesus, uh, well, that's the setup, right? And are they also asking about the sign of his coming at the end of time? In other words, what we call the second coming? That's probably where many of you, if not most of you, uh, come from, where, where most, what most of you have been taught, that the disciples ask about the fall of Jerusalem, but also about the second coming. Now, I'm going to suggest there's nothing in the text that suggests that they're looking forward thousands of years to the end of time, as we call it, what we call the second coming. There's no good reason to think that was in the forefront of the disciples' minds. They didn't seem to be anticipating Jesus going away, much less coming again. So I think when they ask about the sign of his coming, they're asking about the sign of his coming to destroy the temple. Now that if uh, I don't know if Lon is on here with us this morning, but he asked one of the questions we'll look at uh, as 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 this idea of the sign and the coming shows up again a little bit later in the passage. I don't think they're asking what is the sign that you're coming again at the end, but what is the sign that you're coming in destruction to destroy Jerusalem? That's what I think they're asking. So Jesus answered, "See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name saying I am the Messiah." It will mislead many. You'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, various places there will be famines and earthquakes. These are merely the beginning of the birth pangs. Then they will deliver you, speaking to his disciples, they'll deliver you to tribulation and kill you, and you'll be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and misarise and mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. And again, this is where a lot of folks say this has to be talking about the second coming because the gospel was in Jerusalem at this point. It hasn't been preached to the whole world. But remember, we looked at Colossians. Uh, in fact, I'll pull that up for you again just to remind you 
Uh, Colossians here, chapter 1. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we've heard of your faith. Verse 5, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you. So it's come, the gospel has come to you in Colossae, just as in all the world, also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing. So Paul here is willing to say the gospel is in all the world, bearing fruit. And again, this we, we have to be careful with prophecy. Um, we want a one-to-one correlation between what is prophesied and what actually takes place. But prophecy is largely dealing with images and, and sort of directionally true uh, statements, right? So at least that's how I see it. So the gospel of the kingdom, back, back to Matthew 24, the gospel shall be preached in the whole world. Paul says before 70 AD, before the fall of Jerusalem, it was. It had gone out of Jerusalem into uh, the far reaches of the Mediterranean, par- far reaches of the Roman Empire. Then the end will come. So this all fits very well with the 70 AD fulfillment of all these things. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader of Daniel understand. And we talked about this. This is Daniel 9 predicting the fall of Jerusalem that Jesus is now pointing to. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Whoever's on the housetop must not go down to get the things out that are on his, in his house. Whoever's in the field, don't turn back at his cloak. Woe to those who are pregnant, those who are nursing babies in those days. Pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. Uh, for By the way, if this is 2,000 years or so in the future, who cares about the Sabbath anymore? Things aren't shut down on the Sabbath. This This is... This is not happening. For then there will be such a great uh, there will be such a, there will be a great tribulation such as not been occurred, sorry has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will, unless those days have been cut short. No life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Um, uh, so, uh, all right. At this point, let me flip over to uh, to Lon's question and. St- See if I can dig in a little bit here. He says, The most troubling thing to me in Matthew 24, 30, dealing with the Son of Man appearing in the sky, referencing Daniel's vision in Daniel 7, I can accept Daniel's vision as Jesus' coronation ceremony somewhere in the time frame of his ascension and the events of 70 AD. However, when he says, The sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and they, all the tribes of the earth, will see him coming on the clouds of the sky with great power and glory, that is, this is no longer a heavenly coronation, but one in which earth-dwelling peoples can see his appearance. So we haven't got there yet in Matthew. I'll come back on that. But you, you see what he's getting at. He's having a hard time saying, uh, my view is that all of this in Matthew 24 is talking about 70 AD and the fall of Jerusalem, destruction of the temple and all that. But it says the sign of the Son of Man is in the sky. All the tribes will see it. Uh, and so Lon here is saying it's hard, hard to fit that in 70 AD. We'll come back to that in a moment. But he has something else that's germane to our what I just covered. Uh, I can see some possible here. Uh, it seems to describe a physical return to earth and not a heavenly scene. Okay, I'm going to push back on that here in a minute. Uh, similarly, the next verse, Isaiah, uh, verse 31, the great trumpet. Uh, it's hard to connect that. I thought he said... Uh, okay, well, I'm, I'm skipping ahead. Uh, I thought he spoke of something here in our the text. So let me let me get back here. Maybe it was a previous question. Anyway, unless these days have been cut short, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. I think that's the elect of Israel that he's talking about, uh, similar to the remnant in Romans 11. Then if anyone says to you, behold... Here is the Christ, there he is, do not believe him, for false Christ, false prophets will arise, will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I've told you in advance. See, he's talking to his disciples here. There's no indication this is for a future generation. I've told you in advance, this is all going to happen, so don't be led astray, James and John and Andrew and so on. So if, you, if they say to you, behold, he's in the wilderness, don't go out. Behold, he's in the inner rooms, don't believe them. 
For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, this is, I believe, parallel to in Luke 21, where it said, where Luke says, or Jesus says there in Luke, when you see the armies surrounding Jerusalem, let me uh, pull that up for you. Uh, I don't remember which verse that is exactly. Here it is, verse 20. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. The sign is going to be obvious. If y'all see the Roman soldiers coming across land, right? They didn't have their drones and didn't have their uh, their F-15s or stealth bombers or anything. No, they, they had to march across the land. And you could be aware they were coming in advance. When you see them coming on Jerusalem, that's the obvious sign. This is the end for Jerusalem. Get out of Dodge. That's what I think is going on. It's going to be as obvious as lightning comes and flashes across the sky. And then it's going to be bloody. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. It's going to be, you know, going to be a lot of death. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And I'm not going to go over this again. We spent a whole lesson on it, but this is all taken from Isaiah 13, apocalyptic language describing God taking one nation to bring judgment on another nation. In that case, it was Assyria, I mean, uh, Persia on Babylon in Isaiah 13. Here it's Rome on the Jews. All right, so this gets back to Lon's question. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with great power and great glory. Okay, so yes, it seems here that uh, this is obvious. It's going to be a sign in the sky, and everyone's going to see it. Maybe, maybe, in which case, Lon, and anybody else who's in that camp, and I don't mean to pick on Lon, he just asked the question, um, if that's the case, then the burden of proof is on you to show that his topic has switched from the destruction of the temple to the end of time. So somewhere you've got to figure out where and how in this text it's pointed forward. And I want to stress one other thing that he says here in verse 34 Truly I say to you, this generation, the generation he's talking to, will not pass away until all these things take place. So somehow then you've got to show that some of the things he speaks of take place after that generation takes place. Because his statement here is, the generation that Jesus is speaking of, speaking to rather, they are still going to be around when all these things take place. Now, the burden on me is to show how this sign of the Son of Man appearing in the sky can occur in 70 AD because that's what I think is talking about. Okay, here's how. This is one of those times when uh, if you knew Greek, if you studied the original language, it would be helpful. This word sky is the word urano. I don't know if we have any Greek students here with us this morning, but uh, Uranus means sky sometimes, but it is also the term that is most often translated heaven, and it's singular. So you could very appropriately translate this, and I'll look at the Greek here just to be kind of literal here. Then the sign of the Son of Man will be manifest in heaven. Oftentimes, usually, when they mean the sky, the, the, the word is plural, in the heavens. But here it's heaven, singular. So, we've already looked at, and I know Lon sees this because he put it in his comment, the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky is a direct quote from Daniel 7. Let me pull that up for you. And again, we've been over this, so I'm not going to belabor it, but let me just uh, pull out uh, the vision that Daniel sees here. Daniel 7, 13. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven. Same word, 
Uranos. Uh, let me just double check the uh, Septuagint to see if there's another similarity. Okay, not here. So the sign of man, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. His dominion is one which will not be destroyed. So Daniel sees this vision of the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven to the Ancient of Days to receive his crown and his dominion. See that? That's the vision that Daniel sees. Jesus, I believe, is saying the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn. We'll come back to that in a minute. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with great, with power and great glory. I think he is referring to the scene in Daniel when Jesus receives, the Son of Man receives his dominion. Now, what about the tribes of the earth? Uh, this is the Greek word gay, which is used over and over and over again in the translation of the Old Testament. And it can be translated earth. It can be translated land. It can be translated um, inhabited area. We think of earth and we think cosmic. We think the whole world kind of thing. But this is alluding to a statement in Zechariah. I think it is describing the tribes of the earth, meaning the Jews. That's where the word tribes comes from. That's what it's symbolizing. They are going to mourn because their city is going to be destroyed. It doesn't mean they're going to acknowledge Jesus as the Son of Man. It doesn't mean they're going to bow down before him. They're going to be mourning because they're going to be crushed. Right? God, Jesus is going to destroy Jerusalem. He just he, That's how this whole oracle started. He's going to destroy Jerusalem. And in heaven, the fulfillment of Daniel's vision is going to appear. And all the hosts of heaven are going to see it as the Son of Man comes to receive his kingdom. He's coming in the clouds to take over dominion of the earth and rule over it. And the nations are going to come to his kingdom. That's the Gentiles. That's us. And the tribes of the earth are going to mourn because I believe it's the Jews and they're going to be destroyed. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Uh, the great trumpet gathering, uh, that is alluded to in, uh, in Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 27. Uh, yes, okay, so remember Isaiah 27 is the very difficult passage that we looked at where in Romans 11, in fact, while I'm here, let me just clarify something. Romans 11, we looked at the hardening of the Gentiles until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. I think I did not make, I, last night I realized I didn't make something clear in this. So this, so these first three, I'm skipping all around, sorry. He says, a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He'll remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So these first three phrases here about Israel being saved is taken from Isaiah 59. We looked at that. And then this one is when I take away their sins. And I, and I told you that in the, in the original, it's uh, when I atone for their sins or when their sins are atoned for. And it's in the context of the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. And I, I made the analogy that, or I the, pointed out that there are two ways to atone for sins. I think I confuse some people because it sounds like what I'm saying is individual Jews atone for their sins by dying. Well, yes, but the context of this in Isaiah 27 is, is co more corporate. I believe what Paul is doing is he's, tying together the salvation of all of Israel and the fullness of the Gentiles coming in to 
the remnant, the elect Jews, putting their faith in Jesus, and the end of the old covenant era, the final um, manifestation of God's curses from the old covenant in Deuteronomy 28 will take place on the nation. And that's when the hardening is lifted. So in 70 AD, all this comes together in my view. You've got the, uh, the fullness of the Gentiles, the nations coming into the kingdom, Daniel 7 and elsewhere. And you've got God destroying Israel for the final time. And that's how they atone for their covenant sins. And that brings an end finally and fully to the old covenant. So uh, back in uh, Isaiah 27, and I won't go over all this again because we've been over this. But briefly, the question is asked, is God striking Israel like he struck the other nations? And the answer is yes. He contends with them. He banishes them. He drives them away. He expels them through this. Jacob's iniquity will be atoned for. Remember, we talked about how that's a poor translation. And the full price of the pardoning, that's not pardoning. It's its taking away their sin. That he, God's going to bring out the full price on Israel by making the altar stones pulverized, by destroying the temple, which is what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24. It says here, the fortified city is isolated. It's forlorn. The calf is grazing there. It's going to be desolate because no one's going to be there because God's going to destroy them all. Then he says, in that day, the Lord will start his threshing from the flowing stream of the Euphrates to the brook of Egypt, and you will be gathered up one by one, O sons of Israel. He's going to gather the elect after that. You see this? In that day, after he's destroyed Jerusalem, he is going to start gathering Israel one by one and bringing them back. It will come about also in that day, a great trumpet will be blown. And those who are perishing in the land of Assyria, those who are scattered in the land of Egypt, will come and worship the Lord in the holy mountain at Jerusalem. So here in the context of the destruction of the temple, we see he's going to start gathering Israel. And one of the things that we've got to remember is, from a, from a uh, the, the Bible is written largely from a Jewish-centric perspective. In Ephesians 3, Paul says one of the great mysteries is, that the Gentiles are included in all the promises to Israel. So when you see all these predictions that God's going to bring Israel back, bring them into Jerusalem, bring them back to to him, we now understand that includes the Gentiles. So this great trumpet going out and gathering his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other, that includes Gentiles, the nations as well. So after the fall of Jerusalem, he's going to sound his trumpet, Send his angels out, and they're, and he's going to start gathering all of his people, the sons of Israel, which includes Gentiles, to Jerusalem. I believe this is the Great Commission. I believe the great trumpet has been sounding, and he's been gathering his elect from the four winds since the fall of Jerusalem across the whole world. So that's what I think he's getting at. All right, I see some comments here. Uh, let, me, uh, let me take a look and see what they say. Peter says, did you get a look at Isaiah 41 and 2 in light of our understanding of Romans 11? Do you believe this is a state before the Jews' rejection of Jesus? Let me take a look at that. Isaiah 41 and 2. And I'll take the uh, comment down. So, Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended, her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And of course, this statement of comfort coming out the end of verse uh, chapter 39, uh, remember this whole business with Hezekiah, uh, he did some bad things. God's going to judge him and so on. But he he asks the Lord for mercy. The Lord gives him mercy, gives him that sign. And God says, okay, it's not going to happen in your day. You're, you're going to live and die with your be with your fathers, Hezekiah. But behold, the days are coming when all that's in your house and all that your fathers have laid up in the store will be carried away to Babylon. Okay, it's not going to happen in your day, Hezekiah, but Babylon's coming to destroy 
Jerusalem. And Hezekiah just shows his true colors here, kind of goes, whew, all right, well, at least it's not going to happen in my day. Anyway, so then the next oracle is comfort. Comfort my uh, my people, says God. Speak kindly. She's received double for all her sins. And then we get into this very familiar section that's quoted in the New Testament about John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus, right? Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness and make smooth in the desert and so on. So with all that, uh, let me get back to Peter's question again. Did you look at this in light of 3, 5 with regard to your understanding of Romans 11? Do you believe this was a state before the Jews' rejection of Jesus? Uh, do I believe... Did you, did you look at Isaiah 41 and 2 in light of 3 through 5? Is that... Um, Isaiah three, uh, 43 through 5. Regarding your understanding of Romans 11, do you believe this was a state before the Jews' rejection of Jesus? Not sure. First of all, I guess I'm not entirely sure if I understand your question. Um, the Jews receiving double for their iniquity. Hmm. I don't know. That's a very interesting question. It, my my first thought is that would still be looking at the the coming fall of Jerusalem. Uh, Peter says yes, Isaiah forty three through five. So Isaiah forty three through five is clearly talking about Jesus, right? John the Baptist calling out, uh, prepare the way for Jesus. Um, I guess what I've thought, and I need to ponder this more. What I've thought is the comfort is coming. Uh, announcing the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, God's going to bring that destruction. The, the Babylon destruction is not the full one and final one, but there's in that same time frame, there's comfort with the coming of the Messiah. Uh, could that be, is that what you're getting at? Am I, am I agreeing with you stating what you're seeing or something else? So, while I wait for you to kind of respond to that, let me look at some other comments here. Darren says, John's gospel was written to prove the divinity of Jesus and not synoptic like the other gospels. Um, yeah, certainly, John, there's a lot of things in John, right, that are not in the synoptics and vice versa. So there's some there's some differences there for sure. Um, Edgar says, Jesus is going up to heaven, not coming down from heaven. Yep, that's the scene in, uh, in Daniel, exactly. Uh, Salty One, love that name, says... After the tribulation in Matthew 24, it talks about the sun and moon. Is this is not this the reference to the sun and moon in Revelation 6, the sixth seal? Yeah, good question. So uh, I don't know if you were with us when we looked at Isaiah 13. I, I believe he's using the same language from Isaiah 13 and Ezekiel 32, I think it is, and some other apocalyptic language in the prophets that simply refer to... Um, God uses language of uh, cosmic heavenly perturbations, the the stuff going on in in you know the stars, moon, and sky, sun, and all that to describe the awful destruction that's coming on a nation. Um, so I I would first say look at Matthew twenty four in light of Isaiah thirteen. Now where how does that tie into Revelation six? Similar language for sure, absolutely, and that's all all over the Re- the book of Revelation. The question is. Again, so much comes back to timing. And I, I, I'll tell you, I don't know. Uh, there's nothing, there's no good external evidence to help us determine when the book of Revelation was written. When did John get this vision? So now we're left with the internal evidence. What does it seem like in, in, the, uh, in the text itself? There's a lot of good reasons to think it was written before 70 AD. And there's good reasons to think it was afterward. And so if it was written before 70 AD, then those tie-ins to Revelation 6 and other places fit very well with what Jesus is describing here in the Olivet Discourse. If not, if it's after, then we're looking somewhere in the future, and it's hard. Paul says, uh, so the trumpet of 1 Thessalon 4 is a different trumpet from Matthew 24. I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the in the last trumpet there in Matthew, in 1 uh, in, uh, Thess seems to be the end when Jesus does come back the second time uh, rather than the trumpet that's, that's calling out for the, uh, 
the elect to come. Peter says also Isaiah 52, 9 and 10. Let me take a look at that. I don't know if I'm capturing what you're getting at, uh, Peter. I'm sorry about that. Uh, that's the downside of us. Me getting to talk and you having to write. <laughs> uh, so Isaiah 59. Break forth, shout joyfully together, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has uh, comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm on the side of the nations that all the ends of the earth may see the salvation of our God. Uh, I believe this is, Isaiah 52 here is after the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, going out and and calling the nations uh, to him. Peter's got to follow up here and then I'll get it to, to Lon's question. Just wondering on the different states, uh, when God's warfare, warfare with the Jews is over, which seems to be before the cross, the further wrath poured out on the Jews. Yeah, so I see it as the coming of Jesus through 70 AD as a transitional period where God is doing two things. He's bringing the full and final judgment on Israel as a nation. That's why I've argued, you know, my perspective through this is the fullness of the Gentiles coming in and the hardening of, of Israel being lifted, I think that took place in 70 AD. Uh, as I put together all the pieces from Daniel, Isaiah, and Jesus in Matthew 23, where he says all, let me just, let me just pull this up uh, because I think it's, it's important to what we're getting at here. Um, at the end of Matthew 23 where he uh, is, you know, just laying into the, to the Pharisees. He says, uh, uh, Woe to you, scribes, oh, you're already there, sorry. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets. You say if we'd been alive, we wouldn't have shed their blood. So you testify against yourselves that you are sons of those who murder the prophets. Fill up then. Interesting, the same word that's used in in Romans 11, fill up, uh, fullness, that word. Fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers, right? So he's telling his generation, you are going to pay the price for the sins of all your fathers. Do you, do you see how that, there's a, there's a culmination here. There's a, there's a, it's been building and building and building. This is what I think he meant in Romans 9 about God endured with patience the vessels of wrath, and the generation alive in Jesus' day, the Jews of Jesus' day, are the ultimate vessels of wrath who are going to receive his, the full outpouring of God's anger and indignation based on the covenant, the old covenant, and their breaking of the covenant with all their idolatry and so on. So fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? You won't. Therefore, behold, I, Jesus, am sending you leaders of the Jews in his day, prophets, wise men, scribes, that would be the apostles and so on. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. Now look at this statement. So that upon you, the Jews of Jesus' day, upon you will fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Now, obviously these people were not alive when those people were murdered. But he's holding them accountable. God, in the old covenant, right? I will visit the sins of the fathers on the third and fourth generation and so on. So their rejection of Jesus as Messiah, they're crying out, crucify him, crucify him. Jesus said it would have been Tyre and Sidon will raise up, rise up against you on judgment day because if they had seen what you have seen, they would have repented. But you have seen me raise people from the dead and so on, and you didn't repent. You put me on the cross. You are going to receive the full and final curses of the old covenant is what I think is going on here. Truly, truly says here, all these things will come on this generation, the generation he's talking to. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. I'm going to destroy Israel. In Jerusalem and the temple. And I believe that is the full and final outpouring of God's wrath for the old covenant. So I think that's what's going on from the time of Jesus 
leading up to the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So it's a transitional period. God ends the old covenant with the final outpouring of his wrath. And at the same time, with the gospel starting in Jerusalem and spreading out, he is building the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus, that, that Daniel saw in Daniel 7 and elsewhere. The trumpet's being blown. The angels are going out to the four winds. The Great Commission is started and continues to this day. So you have that 40-year transitional period. Now the Old Covenant is over. The kingdom of Israel is done. It's, it's over forever. And now it's the worldwide kingdom of Jesus Christ as the gospel bears th- fruit in all the nations. And so all those worldwide declarations of Isaiah, the prophets of the, of the, the sons of Israel coming back to Jerusalem, that is now the elect across the whole world. That's a long answer to your question. I may not even be answering your question, but that might at least get at it a little bit. All right, Lon had something here, a salty one. Did I, uh, yeah, I said, okay, Lon says, uh, what do you think we do with all this new info? I could not begin to articulate this position to fellow believers sufficiently to convince them how does it affect our walk with Jesus? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Yeah, this takes a lot of work, right? And it's so different from what most people are taught. And, oh, wow, our time is getting away here. Um, uh, I think we just teach as we can. But if, if you start to get this, you're going to see there's a lot of passages in the New Testament that we traditionally have thought are pointing toward the second coming that probably are speaking about 70 AD. And you're going to find a lot of people who aren't going to like that. For some reason, we think that, I don't know, it uh, it takes away some of the stuff that we're looking forward to, which most of it's bad, right? Who wants to who wants to think there's a tribulation coming? Maybe there is, but um, how does it affect our daily walk with Jesus? Um, if I'm correct about all this, then some of the passages about the last days, we're talking about the last days of Israel and don't necessarily apply which allows for some of the optimism that I've been arguing for to take root, which means uh, if I'm correct, and I, you know, I may not be about, about all this, and I, I told you I'm not willing to call myself post-mill here just yet, but I'm optimal, I'm optimistic. Uh, all that's going on with uh, the abortion stuff here in America and the left, the liberals, the, the craziness, the transgender, all this stuff that's going on, you can see how that's God's judgment on our nation and it's going to get worse and worse and worse, and maybe we're living in toward the end, and it's all going to get bad, and, and God's judgment is coming soon. Very possible. It's also possible that God is exposing all of this like never before, and he's going to bring a revival. And we're going to, conservatism and more importantly, Christian, true Christian faith is going to rise up, squash all that. We get more Christian leaders in our governments and pass laws that are much better and things turn around. So I could see both of those happening. Um, Don't know which one, but uh, that's part of how it would uh, affect us. And Lon, follow up here and then we'll call it a day. Can you address my question regarding the taken and the left? Yep. Let's come back to that tomorrow uh, since our time is fleeing. And I know some others have that same question and we'll continue working through Matthew 24 and see, because there's somewhere along the line, here's a, here's a teaser for you. Matthew 25, of course, we have that great vision of the uh, sheep and the goats. I think that is talking about final judgment. I think, although there are times when I wonder, and the reason I wonder is, just like I pushed back on you earlier and said, if you're going to make Matthew 24 about thousands of years later, you have to find warrant in the text because all the time indicators in the text indicate within a generation. Well, if I'm going to say Matthew 25 and the sheep and the goats is the return of Christ, the end of time, the great judgment, I have to prove, I have to show why and where the context has changed to the end of time. And that ain't so easy. (laughs) So we'll come back and talk about that tomorrow. Have a great day in the Lord. Rejoice. See you tomorrow.